Talking to an Iraqi exile and saying to her that I understood how grim it must be under the lash of Saddam. But you don't, she replied. You cannot. You do not know what it is to live in perpetual fear. And she is right. We take our freedom for granted. But imagine not to be able to speak or discuss or debate or even question the society you live in. Intelligence gathered by this and other governments leaves no doubt that the Iraqi regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. This danger will be removed. We must face the consequences of the actions we advocate. For those of us who support the course I'm advocating, that means all the dangers of war. War or no war. Democracy or tyranny. Do the people have a voice? Can they change the minds of their leaders to save the lives of others? My name is Chester Young. I'm a British citizen who grew up under several gangster dictatorships in Sierra Leone, Africa, while the country was ravaged by civil war. I traveled to the UK in search of democracy, and this passion took me to the street of London in 2003, when people were demonstrating against the war in Iraq. For nearly 10 years, I have continued to follow protesters in London in an attempt to grasp the true nature of our democracy. In November 2003, I met Brian Hall, who in 2001 left his wife and seven children to set up a camp in Parliament Square in protest against the UK government's policies in the Middle East. With his banners and loud hailer, Brian Hall slept, ate, even washed outside Parliament, to the irritation of many, but not all, inside. You can't see what our bombs do to people anymore. You can't see it. Just... He wasn't the lone weirdo, many assumed, but married with seven children. His ever-presence turned him into an icon himself. Why am I so passionate? Because I'm a father. I'm a human being. I'm a Christian. I'm a British citizen. I am responsible for what my country does to other people. That's why I'm here. Not because I'm a hero or a saint or anything else. I'm here because I am responsible. This is called a democracy, you see. And in a democracy, the people are responsible for what the leader they supposedly elect, whatever the silly game they play, we're responsible. In 2002, Ken Livingston, the former mayor of London, launched a legal campaign to evict Brian on the grounds of obstructing pedestrians. He failed, and after September 11, Brian expanded his protest to include the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because it's justifiable. I support the people who got murdered by Saddam Hussein. But you don't support the people that got murdered by George Bush or Tony Blair. I'm just saying that I, I was against Saddam Hussein all through the 90s. Most people who are against Saddam Hussein, we don't want dictatorship, we don't want yeah. leaders, we want to rule our lives ourselves, we want to make decisions for ourselves. I can't argue with all of you because I'm on my own. Everyone else is at home. It's over there. I don't agree with him either, but he's quite honest with his point of view. You've just been violent. 
the main reasons for me attending the march uh, were down to the fact that we saw a soap opera played out, if you like. It was very, very clear after 9-11 that America wanted to take a vengeance for the attacks and saw Osama bin Laden as the person responsible and sought him out in Afghanistan. And then within a space of 18 months later, all of a sudden there were all these great links supposedly to Saddam Hussein and that he had some links with Al-Qaeda. The British people did go out and demonstrate for something they didn't want and they were basically just ignored and they weren't listened to. It's demoralising as a citizen and, it's, and it, it does kind of go towards the point of saying that as a person you don't have any power. The government is going to go ahead and do whatever they want to do regardless of what people want them to do. All levels of British society turned out. It didn't matter your class background, your ethnicity, your gender, your ability or disability or whatever. It didn't matter who you were. What mattered was the belief that you came with and the, the, the thought that you wanted to be part of something, that you wanted to say, turn around and say very, very clearly, no, we do not want to invade Iraq. But the important thing, I think, is to recognise that uh, we don't have demonstrations like that in Britain historically. That was by far the largest demonstration there's ever been in Britain. And there was, let's say, guessing there was about a million people on it who have never marched in the streets before. And they really thought that the government must listen. You know, that was the thing. How can the government not listen? We live in a democracy. Uh, we represent the great majority of the people. How can the government not listen? And I think the disillusionment among those million people was enormous. Seven years later, Brian is one of the few protesters left campaigning for peace. I've been a witness since the 2nd of June 2001 at the carriage gates in Parliament, as we have been in their faces for nearly nine years. Barbara, who came from a military family, joins Brian and becomes his pillar of support. Being here, to me, it's just an extension of being a mother and doing what mothers do. I brought up my sons to care. So I'm saying, actually, you do live it. You don't just, OK, turn a blind eye when it's convenient. And I just got what Brian was doing. It well, the government shares the public concern about the current state of Parliament Square and is working with all the relevant agencies to protect this place of national importance. But would she not agree that this is not a demonstration, it's a squat? In 2005, the government introduced a clause in the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, which bans all protests in the vicinity of the Houses of Parliament without the permission of the police. The act was not successful in evicting Bran as the High Court of Justice ruled that. Bran began his protest before the act was passed. All the ones who take us to the court are criminal because they know law. To murder somebody is a crime, isn't it? I'm standing up saying, stop murder. I'm a witness. He's reminding these people every day, that's outside their own sphere of experience. They've never experienced that. A man who's had the guts to stand up to them. And you can see how he's got inside their heads. People's legitimate right to protest, which I support. I support people's ability, their right to protest completely. But there's a balance to be struck between that and desecrating, digging up, causing damage, criminal damage, to a World Heritage Site. And that's why we've been obliged to launch the uh, proceedings that we have. The Mayor of London has got a High Court injunction. I mean, that's extraordinary. A politician has a High Court injunction 
to send us to prison if we don't stop publicly speaking out about the government policies. They launched the Iraq war in March 2003 and in September 2002 they produced a British government document with a lot of uh, fanfare, a lot of fuss. Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and then the subheading, the assessment of the British government. The document is 53 pages long and I did what hardly one journalist did, which is to read the remaining 51 pages. It's the combined wisdom of every department of the British government, of MI6 and GCHQ and the Foreign Office. Everybody has contributed to this. And the first page of text is titled, An Introduction by the Right Honourable Tony Blair MP Prime Minister. And it's written that way to give it authority, to give it the appearance that you're getting this absolutely from the centre of the government. The moment they, they pass the most petty sort of bourgeois laws to do with you're not allowed to have a loudspeaker there, you're not allowed to have the people, the, the guy who's been outside Parliament Square, he's told that even though it's his, it was originally his democratic right for over 900 years to sit outside Parliament in his various forms and protests, now that if he leaves where he is because of a new law, because they would like to keep that area away free from any sort of demonstration, any sort of truth that they're promoting, if he leaves there, he's not allowed to come back. Over the years, the authorities battled to close down the protest, but every time Hall was arrested, he would return. In 2005, the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act had Hall in mind when it said demos must have permission of the police before starting. The Home Secretary at the time, David Blunkett, admitted it was a sledgehammer to crack a nut, but Brian Hall, he said, was a nut and a tough one. And we've got a great weapon on our side, and that is freedom and liberty and it's got the that, those two concepts have the, got the capacity to defeat ideologies of hate i don't think um actually has anything to do with a, a loss of american influence at all i think we, we've got to go back and ask what, what changed policy because policy has changed in the past few years and what changed policy was September the 11th. And then you begin to read this first page and it builds up to its conclusion, which comes halfway through. It tells you that how privileged you are to be reading this document. In fact, it says never before has the British government published a document like this. So you're meant to think that for the first time in history, the British government is sharing information with the population that it would not otherwise share. And in it, even in the introduction, it mentions this 45 minutes claim that became famous later, where it says that Iraq has uh, weapons of mass destruction which it could activate within 45 minutes. And it's an extraordinary uh, concoction of nonsense. Uh, and I suggest that there is not a single fact in them. We need to be very careful in the West and, and here in Britain of the politics of fear and that was all based on fear. All of those different things that went on from rendition around the world to uh, going to Afghanistan to searching out Bin Laden to going to war with Iraq and, and, and all other talk of, of, of other countries and other issues. A lot of it is based on fear. What if? You know, we have to we have to sell our principles out because otherwise we may be attacked. It's part of the political culture because on the one hand they speak about democracy and you would think that democracy involves an educated uh, population. But on the other hand they promote this idea that uh, uh, you give the press a simple summary one page or a half a page summary and that's what the press promotes. Did they say vote for me and I will serve you faithfully? And then the media is calling them our lords and masters. Tell me when things changed. They're still our servants. The way Blair, uh, you know, Tony Blair was operating with Bush at the same time, it just didn't smell right. I was, uh, how old was I? I was about 18 at the time. 
And I think that as a collective kind of friendship group and, and uh, social group, we very much decided we'd like to participate in the march because we thought that actually bombing Iraq is not going to solve any of our problems across the world and actually may endanger and radicalise young people, old people, whoever, people around the world against the West and specifically against Britain as well as America. At the time when over a million people were marching against the, the invasion of Iraq, I was at home condemning the protesters. I fully supported the war in Iraq. I believed um, Saddam Hussein did have weapons of mass destruction. And I was at the time convinced that um, we were justified with evidence that I was presented as a member of the public. We were justified in intervening to um, find these weapons and, and destroy them. Finally, the court decided to let him have three meters length on the square, on the square, and one meter width. That is all he's allowed to have. So we all have to lose weight and squeeze it. <laughs> <laughs> A little baby one like yours, big camera. He said to me, how are you? I replied, how am I? How are the children? How are the children? What's going on, folks? Ours is a nation in denial. Britain, a nation in denial. They try to call us serious organized criminals as we stand up against this nation committing genocide against so many innocents elsewhere. And our people walk by. Shame on my nation. The biggest money-making racket in the world, the arms industry. Check it out for yourself. We'll be seeing you again Thursday night at your dinner. Mounted, getting killed by your weapons. Mounted, getting killed by your weapons. What the arms dealers are doing is disturbing a lot of people's lives. They disturb them by buying the weapons that get dropped on people and uh, kill a lot of people. That is very disturbing. Uh, I'm here because I think it's outrageous that the British government and various arms companies uh, quite happily sell weapons and armaments and equipment, military equipment, to despotic regimes in the Middle East who we consider to be our friends uh, one minute and then turn against them two minutes later. It's the fact that so much of the economy and so many of the jobs and uh, wealth production of society was rooted in producing arms and that these people who were running this military industrial complex had too much power. And going to destroy a country like they've done to Iraq and then get their corporations in to rebuild the country and pay them from taxpayers' money to rebuild the country. It's like crazy, isn't it? It's madness. And yet it's a very cunning little system that they've got going there. I'm going to the largest arms fair in the world. I want to see what this multi-billion pounds industry looks like. Uh, my name is Rhys Ward. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of ADS, Aerospace Defence and Security, which is the largest trade organisation in the UK, covering the sectors uh, aerospace, defence, security and space. The defence trade uh, industry is very important for the UK economy. We are one of the jewels in the cone in the economy. We have captured 22% of the addressable export market. That is a very, very strong position. And it has been built up over decades. Why? Because uh, the investment has been put into the products and services that we are producing at the moment. And that we are a, a very efficient industry and we are keenly priced. The government and the arms dealers meet for this dinner every two years. The police, of course, argue that it's for our safety that we are here, but this is the new terminology of health and safety, where nuclear weapons are quite safe, ha ha, but we have to be looked after safely in a pen. You know, 50 metres away from a hotel with two lots of traffic in between us and the hotel.
last year at Forest Gate, there were huge police searches for weapons because it was meant to have been some kind of uh, possible terrorist thing that turned out to be a false alarm. We told them, if you want to find terrorist weapons, why don't you look in Excel? There are guns and bombs and everything there. You don't need to go around ha harassing a few Muslims, really. I don't know when Judgment Day will come and I don't know if I'll need a gun. But I don't want the kids to kill each other with the guns that you sell there that end up on the streets of Peckham and the streets of Brixton. Well, I tell you what, we're not putting up with your guns and we're not putting up with your war. The government's uh, strategy is to grow the economy through exports. I look at the products that are and services that are produced by uh, the defence and security industry, 43% of those products and services are for export. That is a huge win for UK, the UK economy. And what people don't understand is that if you, uh, when you're talking about wars, it isn't just about oil and that. The thing is, weapons manufacturers, they have to find a market for their weapons because wars are markets for weapons. See, and that therefore, they are behind some of the political influences that start wars. So they like to have the divisions, they like to have the, the division, you know, the, the old rule of uh, divide and rule. They play one religion against another, play one nationality against another, and one race against another. In order to do that, to create wars, they can sell their weapons, make a fortune, while other, of course, workers have to pay for it, and uh, including you and I. I think your question about self-protection, it is a right of every sovereign nation to, 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 to protect its citizens, and indeed it is the first duty of our government. The world today is a more dangerous place than it has been in, in decades, and the threats come from a whole variety of, of uh, factions who wish to do harm for their own reasons. This is a free country, it is a democracy. People are allowed to express their own opinions. If there are a few uh, dissenters who believe that we should not have an arms industry, then I respect their right to, vo to voice that, those concerns and their points of view. The economy and the, the structure of the system are what caused the wars, and then the wars themselves are a drain on resources that could be used for welfare, that could be used for public services, that could be used for people, free education. It's only down to ordinary people marching their thousands like this, saying that we want a better world, one which puts people first. My sister's currently going back to Afghanistan in, uh, in April. She's in the army. But what? She doesn't know any of the people that she's going to fight against. She just sees them as the enemy and is told so. We have to understand that we're all the same and we're not all enemies of each other. And if we do work together, this world can be a better place. Iraqi health officials who say the number of birth defects they see is rising. Parents and medical staff blame weapons used by the Americans. A government study shows high levels of dioxins and radiation have been found in more than 40 sites across Iraq. This is what's going on. They've been using um, munitions called depleted uranium. Now, depleted, depleted uranium is very dense and it's very hard. It penetrates the armor plating of tanks, etc., and then it uh, vaporizes. So it must be some sort of nuclear reaction in order for this very dense, hard material to vaporize. And if you breathe these particles in, you end up getting cancer and DNA damage. We have dropped a couple of thousands of tons of our nuclear waste on this country called Iraq and other countries like Afghanistan, Serbia, Kosovo, Yugoslavia. We have committed nuclear warfare against these countries in the Middle East. No big bang, not like Hiroshima, not like Nagasaki. Same effect, folks. Depleted uranium has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, the Royal Society tells us. Forever. A smidgen of it does that to a babe. Do you know the greatest war crime is to initiate a war of aggression? That's what they hung the Nazis for at Nuremberg. And I want to begin by apologising to young people on behalf of my generation who made a complete muck of the world in which you are growing up. In two world wars, 105 million people were killed. 
I went to Hiroshima once and I was shown something by the guide. It was just a little mark on the pavement. I said, why are you showing me that? They said, that's where a child was sitting when the atomic bomb landed. And the child was vaporized, just disappeared. Now your generation has for the first time in history got the capacity to wipe out the human race. But it's also the first generation that has the technology, the know-how, the skill, the money to solve the problems of the human race. to see what war, to see orphans, to see what happened to Iraqis. All things are destroyed. The country is destroyed. When are we going to be human? When are we going to love instead of hate? When are we going to give instead of steal? When are we going to speak the truth instead of lies? It's time for us to elect honourable people. And when they only give us a bunch of, hey, look at them. Good evening, welcome to the BBC News at six. If he appeared nervous at first, it was an increasingly confident and unrepentant Tony Blair who appeared before the Iraq inquiry today. Mr Blair took his place. He looked pensive. Good morning. Good morning. Gal, at some point the West has got to get out of this, what I think is a wretched policy or, or posture of apology um, for believing that we are causing what the Iranians are doing or what these extremists are doing. We're not. The fact is they're doing it because they disagree fundamentally with our way of life and they'll carry on doing it unless they are met by the requisite determination and, if necessary, force. Well, let's be clear about one thing. The man who is in front of the Chilcot inquiry today has personally profited from the war that he began against Iraq. He said today in his defence Let's not look at what happened in 2003. Let's look at what Iraq looks like today. Well, we want to look at 2003. We want to look at the decision that took us to war with Iraq. But we don't mind answering the question about Iraq today. Tony Blair has said it's better because Saddam Hussein has gone. But Saddam Hussein is not the only Iraqi who has gone in 2010. There's another million Iraqis who are dead, dispersed and lost their homes and their families because of what that man did. It's not just about one Iraqi, it's about an entire country that was destroyed by this man's war. The government is not giving up its fight to evict Brian as the new mayor of London, Boris Johnson, pursues other legal channels to clear the square. Everybody's having fun, aren't they? It's May Day, it's fun, it's carnival, it's play day, isn't it? What are they doing here? What are they doing here? They come here for fun. Are they here when they need it? when there's just one or two of us on the pavement being attacked by the police. You bloody me! Because when, in 2003, we marched away from government, if a few hundred thousand people had sat down here, couldn't have brought in the army, they're busy somewhere else, couldn't have brought in the police, don't have enough, would have brought down the government, and they couldn't have gone to war. I think as it stands now, politics is still the same as it might have been 100 years ago in terms of everything is run from Westminster and decisions are made by kind of faceless MPs who don't really have an understanding of what goes on in local authorities. So I guess it's to make the general public feel as though they can make a difference. You know, it's difficult for them because they're all out trying to survive within the capitalist system and 
trying to just make enough money to survive and it doesn't give people enough time to look about at the wider picture. I think politics is, for me personally, is one of the driving forces behind everything about what we do and how our world and country is really conducted. Things like the, the war on terror, the invasion of Iraq and things 7-7, it's really kind of brought politics and the implications of what our governments do to the attention of everyone because we have to face it on a daily basis. Because at the moment we have a problem where you ask, you ask the majority of British citizens eligible to vote if they're going to vote and it's no, they're not going to vote. And then of the people that can vote and are registered to vote, even less will vote. I'm hoping that a change of policy and a change of parliament means something positive for the country. And it's a very cynical attitude and very pessimistic the way that I am approaching voting. But for me, it's pretty much who is going to do the least damage. And these are your Labour Party candidates. I'm aware of them already, yes. <laughs> no, Labour for Newham. I, I don't tell these guys that, but not all of these votes are going to Labour, unfortunately. I think after today, I think this is the most the pinnacle date for you actually to exercise some sort of power that they give to like British citizens. But after today, it's pretty much in the hands of the government. 10 o'clock, and this is what we're saying. It's going to be a hung parliament with the Conservatives as the largest party. As the authorities find other ways to evict Brown, the selected coalition government now have another battle to fight. Around 30 protesters join Bran in the square and set up a peace camp called Democracy Village. Established just before the elections, it was a reminder to the new government of their continuing military presence in Afghanistan. This is historically an amazing campaign. I think you'll all agree what's been going on here at Democracy Village. And the main uh, focus here has been to bring the troops home from Afghanistan. This is a message to the Metropolitan Police. If you see any terrorists saying messages like bring our troops home, this is not very conducive to the economy. The economy which is very real, just like the government, please arrest them. They are dangerous terrorists. The first area that should be cut is that needless war. We are here calling for whoever is power next to do the right thing and pull the troops out. We need a sign, sign. It because I think that in this situation we're dealing with a government which relies on the use of force to carry out its objectives. So I would be surprised if I wasn't roughed around. Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shazad Tanwi, they both said in their last wills that they were acting because of aggressive Western foreign policy in the Middle East. That war is an illegal war, it's, uh, it's counterproductive to our national security interests and it's costing many, many lives and we need to stop that as soon as possible. One of the reasons this Democracy Village was set up on the Saturday before last Thursday's general election is because the main three parties, the Labour, Conservative and Liberal Democrats, were all unanimous uh, with regards to the war in Afghanistan. So they weren't saying they were going to pull them out. They should be on our soil protecting us, not in another country fighting for you know, dubious ambitions by some uh, politicians in Westminster. I know genocide. My dad knew genocide. He was one of the first to go into Bergen-Belsen. Save those people. My dad was a sniper in the British Army. That's why he was one of the first. The snipers are right at the front, you know. Right at the front. My dad gassed himself 20 years later. My dad didn't say a word to me about going into Bergen-Belsen or being a sniper and lying in wait to murder people. That's the job of a sniper, folks. Except we don't call it murder, do we? We're watching you. We know where you are. We know who you are. We know there are crimes. We are the future government of these islands. Free our streets! Free our streets!
So with the Met either unable or unwilling to do anything about it, Boris Johnson has taken it upon himself to kick everybody out. The GLA technically controls Parliament Square, and so Boris is trying to remove everyone for, of all things, trespassing. But it's not just the newcomers that City Hall have targeted. Brian Hall has also been served with an injunction that could put an end to his near decade-long residency. I'm not the first, by the way. There's some people called the Toll Puddle Martyrs, the Chartists, the Suffragettes were here, the revolting peasants, they were here. Boris Johnson, the Mayor of London, has been trying to evict us. Um, this is uh, the court hearing about the appeal, whether we can stay or not. Uh, we have the human right to protest. That's one of the great things about this country. And we're trying to take it away from us. And um, we're not going to let it. Simple as that. Uh, freedom of speech is absolutely essential in a democracy. And if the administration is corrupt or do things wrong, uh, at the moment we have the, the power of protest to remedy the situation. If that goes, we've got nothing at all. You know, we really need to uh, defend the ideas of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. It's saving lives at the end of the day. If we can save one life, it's worth it. What we need is democracy, and we are, I would, I would describe ourselves as pro-democracy demonstrators. We're, you know, we're on the same page um, as, as comrades across the Arab world in, in fighting for freedom, fighting for democracy. If you live in Westminster, in, in a place as central as that, you, you encounter a lot of homeless people. I have to say, a large number, a proportion, maybe half of them, were ex-military, which showed us really what happens. You know, these, these are people who are told they, 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 can, they need to fight for queen and country, they go to various other places around the world, doing imperialism's work for them, they get, you know, they get wounded, they get, you know, and they come back uh, and they haven't got anywhere to live. Um, and so, of course, a, a lot of them were very much on the same wavelength when it came to the, the crime of the war in Afghanistan. Soldiers around here. Every soldier we spoke to, make it private, have a drink, chat to them, and they say, what on earth are we doing in Afghanistan? Why are we out there? What's it for? This is not our country. We should be back here defending England. There's not a single soldier that thinks it anyway makes any sense. Our country has killed millions so far, folks. So far. How many more millions have to die? We kill our own children. We put them in a uniform. We send them away to fight, to die. For what? So that scumbags can make a filthy fortune out of war. He leaves behind his wife and three young children. As a private ceremony for the families of the three men was held, the roads close to Bryce Norton filled with friends, colleagues, and those who'd simply made the journey to pay tribute to the fallen. We can put pressure on the government to ensure that they get the proper psychological and financial support that they deserve when they come back from that war, whether you agree with it or not. And I hope that we can all join in in fighting harder for that realistic goal. Peace protesters camping in Parliament Square will have to move on after they lost their battle against eviction. The Mayor Boris Johnson says he's delighted with the outcome, especially because lawyers for the protesters say they won't be making any further appeals. I think it's actually rather wonderful as a society that we tolerate this kind of open protest. But the fact is, it has become intolerable. It's become nauseating what they're doing to the, uh, to the lawn and all the rest of it. It's become too much. It's looking squalid and it's doing serious damage to a World Heritage site. So I am very, very pleased. Make sure the cameras can see it. Hey! I'm gonna get ripped off in a minute. We're here having a peaceful protest about the war and they're trying to evict us, so we're fighting our right, we're taking it to court. We ain't going nowhere, mate, simple as that. It's common land, anyone can use it. Day after four o'clock, 
will be in violation of an injunction by the High Court of Justice. You can be sent to prison for that. Uh, you are also currently breaking the bylaws under Section 5 of the uh, GLA bylaws for this land, which means that you can also be arrested for that as well. And if you consider yourself taking part in this protest, then you're also uh, a criminal under the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act uh, 2005. So we're all criminals here. Now, bailiffs have evicted peace protesters who've been staying in makeshift camps in Parliament Square for nearly 12 weeks now. 80 police officers with bailiffs moved in to take them away. Most of them left peacefully. Some grabbed hold of uh, scaffolding and tied themselves to things just to make that, that eviction uh, more harder on the police and the bailiffs to actually get them out. Democracy Village has been removed but the law still protects Brian and his supporters. This square, where our ancestors fought for the freedom we have today, is now caged off from those who still fight for democracy. liberated with young people and and because they were real and they passionate and they cared and you know they were taking the argument to the government and it was it was just like liberating it was absolutely marvelous because they should have been here the whole way along who was Boris to shut down the square Without being suppressed by tanks or jets, the students are able to protest for the future of their children's education, only to be ignored once again. now happened is we have ended up radicalizing a whole bunch of young people around the globe whether Muslim or not that understand us to be tyrants that understand us to be all the things that we are supposedly against you know tyrannical kind of uh, uh, ways of looking at things and oil has to be the biggest question within that so I think people understand that it's about money it was about power it, it has severely damaged us and what you see as the kind of basis or, or, or the result of what's happening is people are turned off. People are against the system, people are not willing to believe politicians, people are seeing everything as, as broken promises and I think let alone that has something to do with the way in which our politicians talk to us but I think we have lost a huge amount of respect. <laughs> The overall strategy is called CONTEST and it st stands for Counter-Terrorism Strategy CONTEST and within that they have what they call a number of strands and one is called PREVENT. If you speak against these things, their version, their conception of democracy uh, or if you speak against what they call the rule of law, if you speak against parliament, then you are preparing the ground for terrorism. Brian has been diagnosed with lung cancer and is in a German hospital fighting for his life. Well, you know, Brian, 
has given all these years to this campaign. This is his life. He's put everything into it. And now, you know, the guy needs to focus on getting better. He needs the space, the time, because he's been subject to so much harassment from this government, you know, who frankly couldn't be more blatant about basically wanting him dead. You know, so disrespectful. They're prosecuting him while he's out of the country being treated for cancer. Veteran peace campaigner Brian Hoare has lost his legal battle to keep his camp in Parliament Square. The ruling can be appealed, but peace campaigners have condemned the judgment as going against the principles of democracy. Brian Hall began his peace campaign in 2001 and his tent and placards became a long-running fixture in Westminster and the focus of a legal battle to evict him. He died yesterday at the age of 62, suffering from cancer. After nine years of following the struggle of these protesters, the gap between the Houses of Parliament and Brand's camp seems wider than ever before. The failure of our democracy to stop the war injured and killed over a million Iraqis, hundreds of British soldiers, and Brian too. The best memorial there can be to Brian is to carry on with his work and finish the job, you know, stand up to the government and say stop killing. You know, he kept it simple, he did the right thing, he stood his ground, he showed you could do it. He should never have had to be here 10 years. He was more than the conscience of this country. He did what needed doing. You have need to permission to so film here. Can you stop You can do everything, but you have need to permission from GL, Little so London Authority. Want. Can I see your ID, please? I don't please? need to give you my ID because yeah. you're in a documentary about the square. You could call the police and do whatever you want. If there is no democracy here in front of parliament, how could we hope to install it in the Middle East? We're responsible. So what are we doing about it? Sod all at the moment, I'm afraid. Two million took to the streets and said, no, stop this, it's wrong. And then they went home again. And the people have been dying for how many years ever since? How can we dry the tears of the children? How can we? And what's the value of those children? Same as mine, folks. Same as yours. Kids are kids, no matter where they're born. No difference. Love, peace, justice for all, for all.